Amen. Look at your neighbor and say, there's no school like the old school. <laughs> Amen. Amen. We are looking at some old school things that we still believe. And uh, we talked about we believe in God the Father last week. And uh, the Lord gave us just a powerful revelation toward the end of that sermon. If you did not get to hear that sermon, it is available in our archives online, uh, on our website, on Facebook, YouTube, uh, Roku channel, all of that, uh, all of our streaming platforms. And you can go back and look at that. We're going to pick up today in our statement of faith with this part. Let me read it to you. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father. <clears throat> All things were made through Him and for Him. He is true God and true man. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and was born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered, died, and was buried, and on the third day He rose from the dead. He ascended to the right hand of the Father, and He will return to judge the living and the dead. His kingdom will have no end. We believe that salvation is by grace through faith in the sacrificial death of Jesus on the cross and that he died in our place. The believer's sins are forgiven by the shedding of his blood. We're going to touch on a lot of the elements of that statement of faith on Jesus, but we won't cover them all. But we are going to look at the fact that Jesus was eternally begotten of the Father. Last week, we shared with you a quote from C.S. Lewis where he talked about folks saying that, quoting that scripture, that God is love, but we have to understand, C.S. Lewis said, that love happens between more than one person. So if God has eternally been love, then he has eternally been more than one person. We believe in the Trinity, God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, that phrase eternally begotten of God. In other words, Jesus was not created he was always there with God, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. We talked about that last week. If you want to uh, hear more about the Trinity and God and God being our Father, then you can look at that sermon. Today we're picking up on Jesus and the fact that not only was he eternally begotten of the Father, but that God from the foundation of the earth, according to Scripture, already had the plan of our salvation in mind. In Revelations chapter 13, verse 8, the Bible says this, All who dwell on the earth will worship him, whose names have not been written in the book of life of the Lamb, slain from the foundation of the world. Now, Revelation is talking about this beast that will come forth and he will uh, take over uh, basically the earth and everyone on earth will bow down and worship him except those whose names have been written in the book of life of the Lamb, but this phrase I want you to look at is the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. We shared with you from John chapter 1 last week, but we're going to look at those scriptures again. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through Him, and without Him nothing was made that was made. In Him was life, and the life was the light of men. And the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it. Wow. I'm going to read a few more scriptures, and then we're going to start breaking this down for you a little bit. I've got a lot of scripture to cover today, so hang with me. In Genesis chapter 1, 1 through 5, it says this. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now, we just got through reading in John chapter 1 that everything was made through the word. And we'll see that in this scripture. We touched on it last week. The earth was without form and void, and the darkness was on the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. Then God said, that's the word going forth, let there be light, and there was light. And God saw the light, that it was good, and God divided the light from the darkness. God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. So the evening and the morning were the first day. Jumping down to verse 14, then God said, let there be lights in the firmament of the heavens to divide the day from the night and let them be for signs and seasons and for days and years and let them be for lights in the firmament of the heavens to give light on the earth. And it was so then God made two great lights, the greater light to rule the day and the lesser light to rule the night. He made the stars also. 
God set them in the firmament of the heavens to give light unto the earth and to rule over the day and over the night and divide the light from the darkness. And God saw that it was good. Now, uh, I want you to know that, that those verses right there are day four of creation. Day four of creation. The first thing we read was day one of creation. God created light, but God didn't create the sun, the moon, the stars until day four. Note that. You see, God had a plan from the beginning. That's point number one. God had a plan from the beginning. In Revelation chapter 13, verse 8, Jesus is referred to as the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. Christ went to the cross at an appointed and specific place in time, a little over 2,000 years ago. But Christ being slain from the foundation of the world illustrates not only that he was foreordained to be slain before the world began, but that God's grace and love for us is an eternal thing. Because God is omniscient, all-knowing, he knew that man would sin and need redemption. But because God is love, he desired to bestow that love on someone, so he created man in his image. Genesis chapter 1, verse 26, Then God said, Let us make man in our image according to our likeness, let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over the cattle, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps upon the earth. The image of God meant that man was to be a spiritual creature. Jesus would say in John 4, 23 and 24, but the hour is coming and now is when the true worshiper, worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth, for the Father is seeking such to worship him. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and in truth. So God created us as spiritual beings that we could fellowship with our spiritual creator. And God intended this fellowship to be permanent, so he placed the tree of life in the midst of the garden that he had created for man to enjoy. As long as the man and woman ate of the tree, they would never die. But God... Because of love, love always demands choice. Love is never forced. Amen. If there's a shotgun at the wedding, love has nothing to do with it. Love demands choice. That's why we ask that question, will you marry me? Instead of you will marry me. Because love demands choice. In other words, if I love you, I give you the freedom to return that love or reject that love. And so God in the Garden of Eden, because he loved us, he put the tree of life there so that man could live in fellowship with him forever. But he also put the tree of knowledge and of good and evil so that man would have a choice. They could love and fellowship with him eternally or they could choose to go their own way. And yet God in his omniscience, all-knowing, knew that man would make the choice to go his own way. And so from the very beginning, God in his foreknowledge knew what man would do, so God foreordained from the foundation of the world that there would need to be a Savior. There would need to be a plan of salvation. The Bible talks about gross darkness covering the earth. There would need to be light. John would write of Jesus that he was in the beginning and in him was light. And that light gave life to men. Down to chapter 3 and verse 16, we know that. A verse, you can quote it with me, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have what? Eternal life. In him was light and that light gave life to men. Eternal life to men. So on the first day of creation, God says something. Let there be light. God created light. I also showed you on day four of creation that God created the sun, all the stars, and all the galaxies, the moon to reflect the sun's light at nighttime, the lesser light, the scripture calls it, 
So God created the entity light three days and however long creation days were, I don't know. They could have been 24 hours because God can do it. All he has to do is say it. It doesn't take him long to create. He just has to speak it and it becomes. That's his power. Amen. And so it doesn't take him long to create. He might, you know, he didn't need uh, maybe more than 24 hours. I don't know how long God took. I really don't. But in the days of creation, it was three days later before he created the sources of light that we know. So what was God creating on day one? Now, I can't say with 100% assurity, but I can say with 100% surety in my spirit and what I believe God's revealed to me that what God was doing from the foundation of the world was that he was speaking the light that would come into the earth. He was putting forth the plan of salvation because man would be in darkness. The Bible says those who walked in darkness has seen, have seen a great light. That was one of Isaiah's prophecies of Jesus coming to earth, that we would be in gross darkness, but there would be a light at the end of the tunnel and it wouldn't be another train. It would be our savior, Jesus Christ, to redeem us from the curse of sin. Hallelujah. If you believe that, give God a hand clap of praise. Amen. So God had this plan from the beginning and because he was omniscient, he knew that man would make the wrong choice. So from the foundation, the very beginning of the world, God, because of his grace, because of his mercy, which flowed out of his love, determined that Jesus would be our Savior. We just had to wait for the right time. The scripture says when the fullness of time came, or at just the right moment, one translation says that God sent his son into the earth. Wow. God had a plan from the beginning that we would be spiritual creatures who would share a spiritual connection with God who is a spirit and we would fellowship with him spirit to spirit. One Old Testament prophet says, deep calleth unto deep. Something deep within us, the spirit that God put in us, cries out to something deep within the heart of God, his spirit. Now we know that God meant for them to live forever because of the tree of life. And in Genesis 3.22, this is after man's sin, after he was put out of the garden, look at verse 22. Then the Lord God said, behold, the man has become like one of us to know good and evil and now lest he put out his hand and take also of the tree of life and eat and live forever. The scripture goes on to say that God put an angel there with a flaming sword that went in every direction so that man could not find his way back to the tree of life. Now that seems a little harsh, doesn't it? But my son Zachary a while back came up and shared a revelation that God had showed him as he was studying this passage in Bible college and uh, that... that uh, that was an act of God's mercy. He has become like us, God says. You see, what had happened was mankind had elevated himself in the, into the position of being his own God. There's even a religion about that. It's called humanism. Man becomes his own God. And because he had done this through sin, that sin had separated him from God's presence. So to live forever would have meant eternal separation from God. So because God was merciful, he did not allow man to keep eating of the tree of life to be eternally separated from him. He had already had a plan in mind. He had already instituted a plan for their redemption. He had already declared that light would come. Amen. Number two, God instituted his plan prior to creation. 1 Peter 1, 18 through 20 says this, knowing that you were not redeemed with corruptible things like silver or gold from your aimless conduct received by tradition from your fathers. Note that, from your fathers. Everybody say, from your fathers. But with the precious blood of Christ as a lamb without blemish and without spot. He was indeed foreordained before the foundation of the world, but was manifest in these last times to you. Wow. Wow. So God had this planned in mind from the very, very, very beginning. In 2 Peter uh, chapter 1, verse 19, 
We see this. And so we have the prophetic word confirmed, which you do well to heed as a light that shines in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts. Remember, God had said, let there be light. Jesus, John would write, in him was light. And I'm going to read that in the King James Version. It says, we have also a more sure word of prophecy, wherein too ye do well to take heed as, a, as unto a light that shineth in a dark place until the day dawn and the day star arise in your hearts. The day star, huh? Literally, that word day star in the Greek is the word phosphoros. Does that sound familiar? Phosphorus, which means light bearing. It means a morning star or the sun uh, is described as the day star. Literally, it means the light bringer. <laughs> so let's read that again. Uh, put it back up on the screen in the New King James, and we'll read that. And, and, and where it says morning star, let's put in the word light bringer. And so we have a prophetic word confirmed, which you do well to heed as a light that shines in the dark place until the day dawns and the light bringer arises in your hearts. Wow. Wow. He is the light bringer. He is the light that shines in the darkness. Now, back in Genesis, in that same chapter where God said he didn't want man to eat of that tree and live eternally separated from him, in that same chapter, we have the first light of redemption. So number three, the first light of redemption that you can find is in Genesis chapter three and verse 15. He is speaking to the serpent in the curse and he says to the serpent, and I will put enmity, that means make enemies of, you and the woman, and between your seed and her seed, and he shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. He shall crush your head would be a little bit better translation there. He's saying to the serpent, Satan, I'm going to make enemies of you and the woman. And the seed of the woman, notice he did not say the seed of the man. The seed of the woman will crush your head and you will bruise his heel. That is the first light of redemption that we see in scripture. The first promise that God was going to send a savior. Uh, Bible scholars call it in Latin the proto-evangelium. The first promise that the savior would come. But then God went on to sprinkle that light throughout the Old Testament to point to his Messiah, his Savior. The word, word Messiah means Savior. In Genesis chapter 12, verse 3, he was speaking to Abraham and he said, I will bless those who bless you and I will curse him who curses you. And in you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. Now that's a prophecy because Jesus would come from the lineage of Abraham. And he says, Abraham, there is one coming from your lineage that will bless all the peoples of the earth. From your lineage, all the families of the earth will be blessed. Let's look at Micah chapter 5 verse 2. A more sprinkling of that light in the Old Testament. But you, Bethlehem, Bethlehem Ephratah, though you are little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of you shall come forth to me the one to be ruler in Israel, whose goings forth are from old, from everlasting. In other words, again, he's saying from everlasting, from eternity, he goes forth and he's going to show up in Bethlehem and he's going to be a ruler in Israel. I'm going to send the one. I like that, the one. In Psalm chapter 22, Psalm chapter 22 is a very prophetic psalm. And I want you to look at, uh, we're going to look at three passages in Psalm 22 that sprinkle light to point us to who the Savior was and how God was going to bring that light of salvation to us. In Psalm chapter 22, the very first verse says this, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from helping me? And from the words of my groaning. In Psalm 22, 7 and 8, it says this, all those who see me ridicule me. They shoot out the lip. They shake the head saying, he trusted in the Lord. Let him rescue him. Let him deliver him since he delights in him. In Psalm twenty-two sixteen 16 through 18, it says, for dogs have surrounded me. The congregation of the wicked has enclosed me. They pierced my hands and feet. 
I can count all my bones. They look and stare at me. They divide my garments among them, and for my clothing they cast lots. Wow, that's very specific that David wrote. As a matter of fact, some people say, well, you know, that's so specific to the story of the crucifixion that perhaps someone wrote it afterward. And then they went back and stuck it in the Psalms. But evidence proves to us that this Psalm was written approximately a thousand years before Jesus came. Historical evidence shows us that a thousand years before Jesus came, David wrote these words. Now, I want to highlight this psalm and these references to the actual crucifixion of Christ. And we'll include, uh, I'll just tell you what the New Testament references are. They won't appear on the screen. In Matthew 27 and 46, as well as in Mark 15, 34, Jesus cried out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? In Matthew 27, 39 and Mark 15, 29, it says they mocked and hurled insults, shaking their head at Jesus. In Matthew 27, 41 through 43, they shouted, He trusts in the Lord, let the Lord save him. In Matthew 27, 35, they nailed him to a cross, piercing his hands and feet. In Matthew 27, 35, Mark 15, 24, and Luke 23, 34, they divided his clothes and cast lots for them. You see, the accuracy and specific nature of David's prophecy shows us that God was specifically pointing out who his Savior was. He was pointing out that Jesus was the Savior. If anyone should ever ask you where in the Old Testament it predicts Jesus' death, Psalm 22 would be a good place to show them. He very specifically points to the crucifixion of Jesus Christ, to the piercing of hands and feet, a thousand years before crucifixion was ever invented by the Romans. God also reveals his Messiah, his Christ, by the Spirit. By the Word, but also by the Spirit. Now Christ is the Greek transliteration of the Hebrew word Messiah. They both mean Savior or Anointed One. John 4.25 says this, the woman said to him, I know that Messiah is coming, who is called Christ. When he comes, he will tell us all things. Now, I've already used a reference from John chapter 4. That was Jesus speaking to the woman at the well. And she said, well, exactly where are we supposed to worship? Because my ancestors say you should worship here. Your ancestors say we should worship there. And Jesus said, God's a spirit. You must worship him in spirit and in truth. Yeah. And, and, and then later on, she, she responds to that. And she says, well, hey, I, I know that Messiah, the Christ, is coming and he will tell us all things. So Messiah, Christ, interchangeable words in the New Testament. Matthew 16, 13 through 17 says this. When Jesus came into the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? So they said, some say John the Baptist, some Elijah. Others, Jeremiah, one of the prophets, verse 15, he said to them, but who do you say that I am? Simon Peter answered and said, you are the Christ, the Messiah, the anointed one, the Savior, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered and said to him, blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. So God showed us in his word who the Messiah would be. Then God shows us by the spirit. He identifies Jesus in our hearts by the spirit of God. When we hear the word of God, we have that knowing in our spirit, that recollection when God's spirit speaks to our spirit, that what we're hearing is truth. Our next point is this. The virgin birth was necessary to fulfill God's plan. The virgin birth was necessary to fulfill God's plan. In Romans chapter 5, verse 12, we see this. Therefore, just as through one man, sin entered the world and death through sin, and thus death spread to all men because all sinned. Wow. The 
The Bible points out that that sin entered the world through one man. What was his name? Adam. Adam. And through Adam, all have sinned. Now, Josiah wrote that right, that next reference uh, down wrong, but let's uh, go to Romans 5, 15 through 17. Romans 5, 15 through 17, if you can get there for me. But the free gift is not like the offense. For if by the one man's offense many died, much more the grace of God and the gift by the grace of one man, Jesus Christ, abounded to many. And the gift is not like that which came through the one who sinned. For the judgment which came from one offense resulted in condemnation, but the free gift which came from many offenses resulted in justification. For if by one man's offense death reigned through the one, much more those who receive abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness will reign in life through one, Jesus Christ. So what Romans is telling us is Romans is pointing out that, that one man, Adam, sinned and that sin through the paternal bloodline is hereditary to all of us. As a matter of fact, Numbers 14, 18 says this, the Lord is long-suffering and abundant in mercy, forgiving iniquity and transgression, but he by no means clears the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children to the third and fourth generation. Wow. Now that sounds almost like the scripture is contradicting itself there, that the Lord is long-suffering, and he forgives, but he doesn't clear the guilty. What does that mean? You see, what he's saying is that even though we are forgiven of sin and we are made righteous and we are justified, the nature of sin that is within us still exists. That's what Paul talks about, putting to death the old man, that old sin nature, putting that to death. Paul says, I... Keep my body under. I have to buffet my body. Amen. I've misread that a few too many times. I have buffeted my body instead of buffeted my body. <laughs> I just I misread that somehow. And I got to stay away from the buffet. I'll just tell you that. So sin is handed down through that paternal bloodline. And, and what he's saying is that that Adamic nature, that sin nature, even though we have been cleared and we have been made justified through God, if we have a child, guess what that child's go, still going to have in him? The sin nature, right? And it says, the fathers to the children. The fathers to the children. You see, because sin is handed down through the paternal bloodline, the virgin birth was necessary to bring forth one who was born like Adam had been created. The scripture tells us that Adam was created in original righteousness and true holiness. Original righteousness, which means no sin had ever happened. He was in right standing with God originally from his creation. And true holiness because he had known no sin up until he disobeyed the commandment of the Lord. Wow. Hebrews chapter 7 verse 26 says this. For such a high priest was fitting for us who is holy, harmless, undefiled, separate from sinners and has become higher than the heavens. How is he going to be separate from sinners? Because the iniquity of the father is visited on the child. Amen. That's why Jesus was going to be born of a woman all the way back to Genesis chapter three, verse 15. The seed of the woman will crush your head, Satan, and you will bruise his heel. Wow. You see, for us to not believe in the virgin birth. For us not to believe the Christmas story, for us to think it's just a story or just a made-up tale, undermines what God was doing in the plan of salvation. Amen. Now, let's say, 
when I was a much younger man, a teenager, that me and my teenage buddy went into the convenience store and we decided we didn't have any money, but we wanted some bubble gum. And so we filled up our pockets with bubble gum and we walked out the door. Now the law might allow me to testify against my buddy and him be punished and me get off. Anybody ever heard of that happening? Yeah. But does that mean I'm not guilty? No. Does that mean his punishment is paying for what I did? No. I'm still guilty. The guilt still remains on me. In order for my penalty to be paid, it has to either be paid by me or by one who is not guilty of what I'm guilty of. You see, there was a young man who was studying to be in the ministry. He wanted to be a youth pastor. And during the summer, those who were studying to be in the ministry would apply to intern at churches. Chuck Swindoll shared this story. And this young man applied at several churches and all of his friends who were also in ministry training with him, they all got places to go and intern for the summer. But every place he applied, no one, just, no one responded to him or either said, no, thank you. And he kept trying and trying. And so finally he ends up having to do something and needing to make some money. So he has some money for the classes in the fall. He starts driving a city bus. And every day he's driving this city bus, he hates driving this city bus. And he's really angry at the Lord because he's driving a city bus when all he really wanted to do is work for him. And to make matters worse, there's some guys that get on the bus every day and refuse to pay. And he's like, man, this, this is just not right. So one day those guys get on the bus and once again refuse to pay. And at the next corner, he sees an officer of the law. He pulls the bus up, opens the door and says, these guys get on every day and don't pay. The officer comes on and says, you either got to pay or get off. They should, he wishes they would have gotten off. They decided to pay. And then they stayed on the bus till everyone else got off the bus and then they jumped this young man, beat him up, put him in the hospital. And he's just thinking, Lord, all I wanted to do was work for you and look at me now. These guys were members of a gang. They were arraigned. Then they went to trial, and it was pretty much an open and shut case. All the people who were on the bus said, yeah, we, we saw them stay on the bus. They were the only people there. It's pretty much an open and shut case. And so the judge is getting ready to hand the sentence. And he looks over at the young man and says, do you have anything to say before I pass judgment? on these individuals. And all of a sudden, the light came on. And he realized that all he'd wanted to do was minister the gospel of Jesus. And so he said to the judge, he said, yes, sir, judge, I would like to say something. Would it be possible for you to total up all the time for all the defendants and would you allow me to serve their time for them and allow them to go free? You could have heard a pin drop in the courtroom. And the judge looked at him and said, am I hearing you right? He said, yes, sir. I would like to add you to add up all the time that you have put for these gentlemen to serve 
add all that up, give that to me and let me serve it for them and let them go free. And the judge looked at him and said, young man, nothing like that has ever been done. He said, I beg your pardon, your honor. It has. I was guilty of sin. I should have died, but Jesus was innocent and he took my punishment upon himself and he let me go free. And he shared the gospel there in the courtroom. The judge denied his request, but you know what he started doing? He started visiting those young men in the prison. And before he would go back to school, <laughs> all three of those young men would come to know Jesus Christ as their savior. And he started a ministry among young people that was what he wanted to do to begin with. Hallelujah. You see, what happened was the light shined into the darkness. Hallelujah. Amen. And God is challenging us in these days. We are living in dark times to let the light shine into the darkness. Amen. The old saying is, anybody can curse the darkness, but who will light a candle? Amen. Amen. <laughs> And the candle has already been lit. In, been, lit in, that's not a word. The candle has already been lit in us. Lit in us. Lit in us. Lord, you know what you were trying to say. I'm sorry I messed it up. The candle has already been lit in us. But Jesus said, nobody, and I'm just going to add to what Jesus said just a little bit. Nobody, here's my parenthetical, with good sense, lights a candle and puts a basket over it. But he sets it up on a lampstand so that the candle can illuminate the whole room that's dark. Amen. But you know what we're doing, church? We're cursing the darkness. We curse it every day on Facebook. Well, it just got personal, didn't it? We curse the darkness every day when we go to work. <laughs> and we're tired of doing this same old thing. We speak cursing instead of speaking blessing. And you know what we can do? We can take what's in our hand like Jesus did. Five breadsticks and two little sardines. And we say, this is nothing. This is nothing in the face of what I'm facing. Or we can give thanks, bless it, and break it, and watch God multiply it. I'm telling you, get your candle out from under the basket and let it shine for Jesus. Amen. Amen. You know why Jesus said, bless those who curse you, do good to those who spite, despitefully use you? What he was saying was, do what that young man did. Show them there's a Savior who has paid a price for what they're struggling with. And instead of pointing out their struggle, point out the light that has come into the world that can deliver them from their struggle. Oh, come on, church. Amen. He didn't call us to point out man's struggle. He called us to point man to the one who can deliver them from their struggle. Hallelujah. Go ahead and praise him if you want to. Amen. I'm saying amen and oh me myself at the same time. Hallelujah. You see, Isaiah 7, 14 said, Therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son. You shall call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. 2 Corinthians 5, 21 says, For he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in Christ. So he sent forth his son, born of a woman, not of a man, so that he would not have a sin nature, so that the only one born ever since Adam was created, the only one born ever without the nature of sin in him was Jesus. So he was the only possible candidate to be the one who could pay the price for the guilty. Only the innocent can pay the price for the guilty. That's what God was illustrating in the law. That's what he was illustrating in the Passover. He said, take a lamb, take a little, take a little cute little white 
or black or whichever color you want, lamb, unblemished, make sure it's cute, cuddly and pretty, bring it in your house for four days. That's long enough for the kids to name it. You know what I'm saying? And then take it out and kill it in front of the whole family. What was God trying to point out? The innocent was going to make it possible for the guilty to live. Hallelujah. And it was not just an unknown innocent. It was a precious lamb of God. He was known. Whew, man. I mean, can you imagine? Can you imagine, Greg, being the daddy that had to do that? In front of those youngins that have been playing with that lamb for four days. Letting it crawl up in the bed and sleep with them because it's so cuddly. Mm -mm. I would not have wanted that job, Jason. No, sir. But neither would I have wanted the job of God the Father who sent his own innocent son to pay the penalty for my sin. God who is rich in mercy. Rich in mercy. Oh, let's go on to our next point. God had a purpose in the plan. Isaiah chapter 53, verses 1 through 6. Stand with me if you will. Who has believed our report? And to who has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant, and as a root out of dry ground. He has no form or comeliness. And when we see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. He is despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised and we did not esteem him. Look at this. Verse 4. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten of God and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement for our peace was upon him. And by his stripes we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Wounded for our transgressions, bruised for our iniquities. If you don't have peace today, I want you to know that Jesus paid for that. If you don't have forgiveness today, I want you to know that Jesus paid for that. If you're carrying transgression today, yours or somebody else's. I said yours or somebody else's. You see, the problem with sin is often there's an innocent victim. So you may be carrying your transgression or you may be carrying somebody else's that was perpetrated against you, but he was wounded for those transgressions. <laughs> you may be carrying your own iniquity. He was bruised for that. You may not have peace in your life today, but he was chastised so that you could. You may have sickness in your body, in your mind or in your spirit, but by his stripes, you are healed. By his stripes, you are healed. I just heard this from the Spirit. If you need healing today, what I want you to do is put your hand in the place that needs to be healed. Hallelujah. And say, by his stripes, I am healed. Go ahead, say it now. By his stripes, I am healed. Come on, let's support him, church. Let's say it together. By his stripes, I am healed. Come on, say it again. By his stripes, I am healed. By his stripes, I am healed. By his stripes, I am healed. Oh, hallelujah. Come on, I believe we need to declare it again. By his stripes, I am healed. By your stripes, Lord, I am healed. Hallelujah. 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 By your stripes, I am healed. Hallelujah. Healing also means wholeness. And there may be something in you that is just, it, it, it may not necessarily be sick, but it's not whole. It's not functioning in your body like 
God intended it to function. Just lay your hand there and say, by your stripes, Lord, I am whole. By your stripes, I am whole. By your stripes, I am made whole, Lord. Hallelujah. We just believe that right now. We just believe that right now. Last thing I want to share with you is God's plan remains in effect. Romans 3.23 says, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Romans 6.23, For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Romans 5.8 says, But God demonstrates His own love toward us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. And Romans 10.9 and 10 promises you this, if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. And Romans 10, 13 says, whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. And Romans 8, 16 and 17 gives us this promise. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ, if indeed we suffer with him, that we may also be glorified together. Bow your heads with me. Father, in the name of Jesus, in the name of Yeshua, Jesus, the Christ, the Messiah, the Savior, the Anointed One, Lord, we ask you to draw unto yourself everyone who's heard this word today. Lord, everyone who's received the revelation of Jesus today, Father, I pray, Lord, that you would cause us to understand, Lord, that you were wounded for our transgressions. Lord, the things that we carry, Lord, that were from our own misdeed or the misdeeds of others, wounded for our transgressions. Lord, you were bruised. For our iniquities, my own sin, you took upon yourself upon the cross. Lord, you were chastised so that I could have peace instead of turmoil in my heart and mind and that I could have peace with you. And Lord, I thank you that by your stripes, I am made whole, I am healed. And for that, I give you thanks. And Father, I pray that everyone who needs healing, who needs wholeness, who needs forgiveness of sin, who needs, Lord, the transgression to be lifted off of their shoulders, I pray now that you would speak to their heart, that you would draw them to you. And Lord, that as they come to you, Lord, and they open their heart to you, that you would come in with healing in your wings and that you would allow your spirit, cause your Holy Spirit to identify in their spirit that they belong to you. You are their father. They are your child. And for that, we give you thanks and praise. In Jesus' name. If you're here today and you need Jesus, I'm going to ask our prayer team to come very quickly. If you need to accept Jesus as your Savior, if you need to rededicate your life to Him, if you're struggling with sickness, or needing wholeness in some part of your body, I just believe there's an anointing of God making you whole today. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. If you're watching online and you need Jesus to touch you, then as we pray a closing prayer in just a moment, I'm just going to ask you to believe with us. And as you speak to God, He's going to hear you, whoever calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Whoever means whoever. That means you and that means me. Hallelujah. God, we thank you and we give you praise. Amen. Can you give him one more praise in this place today?